Um, what we're really doing here fundamentally is doing experimental coral aquaculture. Uh, experimental coral farming, if you will. And that has a number of different um, uh, spin-offs or different implications for the aquarium trade, uh, for laboratory studies, uh, especially those studies that, uh, you, that uh, need a large sample sizes where you actually need to grow and culture this organism. Um, and it also has implications for uh, restoration and mitigation. Now here in Hawaii, uh, coral is a protected species, so uh, really the implications for the aquarium trade don't really apply that much here. Um, there are definitely implications uh, for laboratory studies, but we felt that in Hawaii, uh, uh, meeting the, uh, the goals and objectives of the Hawaiian Coral Reef Initiative, uh, that this area would be uh, the most important area to focus on. Um, now there have been a lot of efforts in the past, efforts at uh, active restoration with corals. And mainly this has involved uh, transplant, uh, transplantation of either entire uh, colonies or small fragments. Um, in general, um, these efforts are very expensive. They're an enormous effort. Um, and generally they've failed to meet expectations. Uh, after a long enough period of time, um, transplantation may be successful in the beginning, but in a, in a long enough uh, time scale, uh, things generally seem to go, go down either in, because of the heart, habitat is marginal uh, or because of attachment failure, things on, of that nature. There's also a question of scale. The things that we can actually physically positively influence with our hands is uh, the scale of that is really small compared to the size of a coral reef. Um, so there's been a lot of criticism of active restoration methods because it diverts, it, it has a potential to divert resources away from reducing the threats such as uh, overfishing, runoff, and pollution. Um, however, uh, we need to take some important lessons from terrestrial ecology. And that is that in many instances, in some cases, uh, recovery might not happen at all without some direct uh, intervention. At least over a time scale, it's perceptible to human beings. Um, also, another important lesson that we can take from forestry and silviculture, which is the uh, science of uh, growing trees, is that they use uh, extensively this concept of a nursery uh, concept, um, which really takes advantage of um, a life history characteristic of trees. It involves a trade-off between size and survivorship. So smaller propagules have a much lower chance of survivorship. You put them in a nursery, you can uh, potentially create a refuge from those causes of size-specific mortality until they're large enough. So uh, it's an idea to mass produce uh, trees, and in this case, uh, we want to try to apply it to coral. Um, so really, the main proponent of this is uh, Buki Rinkovich, who's really the pioneer in this uh, area of research. And we were fortunate enough at the Waikiki Aquarium, while uh, Cindy was the interim director there, uh, to conduct a study uh, in 2005 that just got published in Aquaculture in 2006. And actually at that time, Hickory was half uh, funding my salary for doing genetic work. Um, we used, uh, so we really wanted to test the idea of a coral nursery. Uh, we used really tiny uh, fragments of Paredes lobata and Compressa. We had very high survival uh, rates. We had fast doubling time. This just shows a uh, uh, typical result. We found that growth rate increased with size um, and we were able to identify some of the causes of size-specific mortality, and more importantly, we were able to demonstrate that certain nursery conditions could completely remove those causes of size-specific mortality. So for Hickory 8 uh, goals for this year's project, we wanted to develop protocols for culturing coral. We wanted to look at optimal conditions for growing coral, and those variables that we wanted to look at were uh, light, water motion, and uh, nutrition, or some kind of water quality parameters. Uh, we wanted to do a fusion experiment to try to get uh, coral to encrust over as large, uh, large a surface area as we possibly could. And we wanted to provide, um, we wanted to do an experiment, a field experiment looking at optimal outplanting size. We also wanted to provide source material to other workers and other, uh, we wanted to make sure that we were able to culture more uh, coral, uh, all the coral that we used in our experiments and be able to grow coral without removing it from the wild. Um, so we moved the coral that we had from the aquarium to Kiwalo, and we've been working with those same uh, colonies ever since. We also wanted to develop alternative attachment methods, uh, since attachment failure is uh, such an, an important issue, um, and also look at their effects on culturing coral. So most importantly, the results uh, from the light and water flow experiment. 
Uh, this was an experiment that looked at both the combined effects of light and flow, since the variables uh, most likely do interact. Theoretically, this is how they may interact. Um, light, as light intensity increases, one might expect the rate of photosynthesis to increase up to a point of maximum photosynthesis. Beyond that point, uh, photoinhibition starts to occur. Um, so there's just too much light for the pho photosynthetic machinery to handle. And what we're really, really interested in is finding this point. Uh, but we're also interested in how flow uh, affects things. So increased flow, uh, what it may do is increase the point of maximum photosynthesis and uh, increase the, uh, the amount of light intensity that coral is able to uh, withstand. This is because you're increasing the amount of gas exchange that's going on. Um, so that is kind of the theoretical model. This is the experimental design that we performed. So we had um, four different light treatments. This is uh, full sun. Uh, one, two, and three layers of 50% shade cloth. Uh, we had uh, two different types of flow, high flow and low flow, uh, which I'll talk about in a moment, and uh, two replicates of each. Uh, and then we had these different test chambers, which we randomized uh, as far as position. At 480 nubbins, uh, 240 per species, we chose Montipora capitata and Parietes compressa. 60 per treatment, 30 each species, and three separate genotypes. Um, this is a photograph of our experimental setup. Um, so we have a, a pre-filter here, a 500 micron mesh bag filter. We're going then to this um, uh, garden variety uh, funny pipe is what it's called with these micro sprinkler nozzles that are adjustable. Uh, we put the corals in this one, c the one centimeter plastic mesh and just held them in there just by forcing them in. The mesh is kind of flexible so it holds them in rather well. Uh, we would then adjust the nozzles and we would measure the fill rate um, and we would also measure the, the rotations in the bucket with this fluorescein dye. And from that we were able to infer the, the flow rate over the surface of the nubbins. This is a look at the controlled variables. So we have average fill in uh, mils per second. So this is the high flow treatment. This is the low flow treatment. If we look at water motion, this is uh, inferred from our fluorescein dye and also estimating the, the diameter of the bucket. Uh, we end up with, uh, for the high flow treatment, around uh, 10 or 11 centimeters per second. And for low flow, we end up around 3 uh, centimeters per second. So these are actually pretty realistic values for what coral might uh, experience on the reef, uh, although it is a constant linear flow in a circle. Um, and then for our shade cloth, we have photosynthetically active radiation. Uh, this is measured in micromoles per meter per second, which should be there. Um, so we're under full sun, we see around 1,200 micromoles per meters per second. 50% uh, shade cloth, the one, one layer we see around uh, 450. Two layers we see around 200. And three layers we see maybe around 100. So we have pretty nice control over the variables using this uh, type of a system. We also have fairly decent sample size. So we've got some fairly decent power to detect some things. Uh, so the results, we, over 41 days, we noticed extremely high um, survival. Um, and this is actually the highest survival that I've seen yet. Um, and there, this is despite the fact that there's almost no maintenance um, on the system um, other than once a week we would wash the buckets out. Um, only three nubbins died, two of them were uh, compressed, and it was because uh, um, Festilla came in through the system and killed those two. Um, overall net growth, we had 50% uh, net increase in area for Parietes and 9% for Montipora. Uh, this is an, we did two separate measurements here at 19 days for parietes. Uh, um, this is the high flow measurement and the low flow here in blue. This is actually centimeters, uh, square centimeters. Um, so it's pretty substantial uh, growth and a very clear uh, difference between the different uh, shade treatments. Here's full sun, one, two, three uh, shade cloth. Um, so at 19 days, we see this clear pattern, a nice trend. Uh, parietes compressor really seems to like full sun. And this is sitting in a little tiny few inches of, of water. Um, so we haven't found a photo inhibition point for parietes yet. This was done during the winter months, though. So we'll see what would happen in the summer. Um, after 41 days, the pattern starts to change. For the low flow, we see the uh, very nice trend towards higher and higher uh, light increased growth. But for the high flow, we actually start to see uh, an increase in variance and uh, a, uh, a kind of an obliteration of any trend uh, <coughs> as far as the different shade cloth. So actually in the dark, it's actually growing better in the low flow, which is pretty interesting. 